haunted trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley, our resident uh, historian, and today we head to uh, northern British Columbia again. Uh, not as far north as Telegraph Creek, but pretty far north anyway. Edge of the frontier, Mike. Fort St. James, one of the, I think, the best preserved fur trading fort in North America. Now, nothing really, there are other forts that are being preserved, Fort Edmonton and Langley and so on, but nothing touches Fort St. James. Several reasons for this, Mike. When you look at the major buildings in Fort St. James, out of the six buildings there, five of them are original. Dating back to when? Well, dating back about just over 100 years. And uh, it is beautifully preserved. The general warehouse, which we see in this shot, is as it was then. And uh, most of the other buildings are exactly the same. There were four forts there originally. This is the last fort site. And this was the domain of the Carrier Indians. So what we're going to do today, essentially, is look at some of the individuals who walked through the gates of the fort and some who refused to walk through the gates of the fort. Oh, there's so this is Fort St. James. Contentious issues, okay. That's right. And in a very, very unique part of British Columbia. And you go just, just beyond the fort. 10 miles north, and you really are in the wilderness. Okay. Stewart Lake is uh, in this area? Stewart Lake. It's right on the edges of Stewart Lake, and Stewart River is very close by the fort. Okay. Fort St. James, uh, tr fur trading fort, and uh, not a simple heritage. We'll do that right after this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley heading to northern British Columbia, uh, Fort St. James. Now, sure. the Carrier Indians, as you said, this was their domain. They were there from pre-European history. Of course. What is the start of European history here? Well, the start is 1806, July the 26th, actually almost 200 years ago or close to it. And a flotilla of whites in canoes approached the shore of Stewart Lake which is about 40 miles long, rough lake, stormy lake. It is a stormy day. The Indians gather on the shore because they haven't seen whites before and they're straining to see who's coming into shore. The whites, just before they land, they lean out of their canoes and they fire a volley of musket shots in unison. The Indians fall flat. They think it's thunder, they think something's happened. And eventually when they recover, the whites then step ashore. They are setting the tone of the meeting. And when they step ashore, the Indians are absolutely astounded because here are people with pale white faces, never seen that before in their lives. Some of them have gray eyes, some of them have blue eyes, some of them have green eyes. And more amazing, even more amazing, some of them have curly hair. And some of that curly hair in some of those individuals is red. And this is like uh, this an invasion is like from it, another planet. It so, is, exactly of it is. that. Of course it is. Alien forces yeah. truly said. Yeah, and of course the two leaders are George Simpson, who's later famous in, in the Hudson's Bay Annals, and a man called John Stewart, after whom Stewart Lake was named. So they establish the fort there, and it becomes the key fort in the northern part of British Columbia. It is an integral part of the whole system. Now what happened, of course, we have to briefly go back and take a look. Northwest Company traders, both of those individuals. They eventually Northwest, not Hudson's Bay. Not, Northwest. Not, yeah, Northwest was in a bitter rivalry with, at that time, 1806, with the Hudson's Bay Company. The peddlers versus the gentlemen, right? Yeah. And uh, so anyway, they transfer. In 1821, both of these companies are amalgamated under the banner of the Hudson's Bay Company. And at, at that time, the major fort in North America was Fort Vancouver on the banks of the Columbia in Oregon. That's 1821. But... In 1846, and Fort Vancouver was a very, very important part of the whole. In fact, we have some beads from it, which yeah. is kind of interesting. This is really, these are beads of that era. Yeah, they are. Now, how do you know these are legitimate trade beads? Well, uh, you have to be careful with beads. We know they're legitimate for several reasons. A, the, the key to the, those trade beads is who I got them from. I got them from August Sinclair Millican, mm -hmm. who was a very, very famous historian in British Columbia. They came out of a barrel in Fort, the original Fort Vancouver, and the, he had a number of these, of these sets of beads. And the interesting thing is, it says China on there. So that, they that, are China beads. Tag, right. But that wouldn't tell you anything. But when you look at it very closely, that's made out of rice paper. 
So these are Chinese beads. They traded with China to get these beads and probably traded furs back to them. So not what it says, but the fact that it's made on China paper, on sure. rice paper, sure. that guarantees the authenticity. Oh, of course, of course. And these were very popular with the native people, I take oh, yes. it. They used oh, this yes. for beadwork and yeah. all sorts of things. Yeah, they like the red and the blue. So and, uh, where'd you get these, by the by? Well, I got them from August and Claire Millican. I bought his collection some years ago. All right. Continue. Well, okay, so, but remember, this is only part of the overall strategy of the Hudson's Bay Company. Here's Fort St. James, and you have a string of, a uh, whole bunch of forts all the way around. You have Fort Graham, you have Fort Nelson. Here's a, here's a picture of Fort Nelson just after the turn of the century, and uh, this gives you an idea. And they're very pretty proud of themselves. They're mm -hmm. proud of their name, and they're proud of the, the string of forts they have. So they have Fort Graham, Fort Nelson, Fort McLeod, uh, Fort St. John, a whole bunch of forts in the north. And they all report to Fort St. James. And Fort St. James is originally known as Fort Stewart. They changed the name somewhere along the line. And this is, this is rather, rather difficult country. Here's an example. Here's what, these, here's, here's what you were doing when you went out in a day's work. You had to, first of all, take your, take your pack train across the river or your horses across the river, and they're swimming the Stewart River. This is about 1897 or 98. That's that such photograph. a great photograph. It's Look a at great the, photograph. Uh, the yeah. sepia tone is on there, yeah. and it's... That is adventure. This would be an adventurer's photograph right Yeah, you there. wouldn't forget it because the, the river is quite cold, and they are cold in the north. Even in the summer, they tend to be a little bit cool, with right. rare exceptions, very rare exceptions. And the next one is what, then they sent these, these pack trains out from Fort St. James to the, other, the various other forts, Mike. And this is one of the forts. They're sending that into Flor Fort McLeod, which is one of the forts that is in the key of the, of the whole strategy in the north. Now, look at their packing stuff up. There's the ever-popular sure. dog. There's, uh, yeah. These would be both European and Indian packers. Yeah, mostly Indian packers. And on a way they go. Yeah. And that's at Fort St. James. Yeah. Look at good, good workmanship. Those oh, look yeah. like good old Norwegian built-style uh, uh, log yeah. houses. That's right. And what happens around the fort is the Indian village grows up pretty rapidly. It jumps from about 75 to 120, 150 in about 20 years to three or 400 people in a fairly substantial Indian village very close by. And the Indian village is also done in log yeah. buildings. Yeah, look at definitely. that. And boardwalks. Oh, and yes. One even has a semi-false front on it, if you look. And way so down the way. that's the Indian village, not yeah. just downtown. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, the Roman Catholic... Uh, Missions are in the area, and this is one of the most famous missions in the far north. I would say uh, governed by the most famous missionary, Father Maurice. And Look, he was that, a Roman that Catholic would be a, uh, an awesome structure to yeah. the native people. Oh, yeah, it? very impressive. That, that was, the, the spire of the church was done to impress uh, the native Indians, and they became quite, quite devout Catholics, and most of them, not all of them. Now, that spire also is very European, and it's oh, yeah. attached to a log building right behind. So sure. the, the juxtaposition is oh, kind of yeah. neat. And look at the substance of this factor's yeah. house. Yeah. I, I mean, that is a huge dwelling, uh, porches all around for yeah. socializing that's and out right. of the weather. Yeah. And that's the uh, factor's home near Douglas Lodge. Well, that's Fort factors or chief traders. Uh, my uncle was in, my great uncle was in charge of the fort. He was chief trader. And then some were factors, some were chief trails. And what uncle was he never this? Made what what was trail? One of the trails. The trail family. Yeah. So we now know that the Barleys uh, and the trails are related, yeah. along with uh, Strickland's. What? Strickland's. Yeah. And the Moody's. And the Moody's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, strange family. Strange family. All conservative. Fort St. James <laughs> is a substantial community. Yeah, it is. It is. It is the key. And the Indians know this. There are things at the fort that they want and they will trade for, and in return, they will give up some of their furs or their made beaver. Now, this would be made beaver. That yep. is a finished beaver pelt. One made beaver. Boy, that is beautifully soft, yeah, isn't I know it? it is. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, that's the skin side, the fur side, and the Indians would bring these to the Hudson's Bay sure. Company in this form. And then they would negotiate for all sorts of different things they wanted. And one right of the on. main things was, was, were trade guns. Now, for example, yeah. there, here's, this is a trade rifle right yep. here. It would is. that have been a good rifle? Yeah, pretty good. Probably get about, they'd probably pay around 10 made beaver for that. Uh, but their, their, trade, their trade list would trade from year to year a little bit. Yeah. It would change slightly. Well, you'd only need one of these one year. Yeah. There's some other neat trade goods that we have on the table here. For example, these three tins yeah. would be the three different sizes yeah. of tobacco that would be available. And all of those are from 1897. That's imperial mixture. That's in the trade list. All these tins are mentioned in the trade list. Excellent. And down in front of it is an axe. That, that axe would be uh, made by, uh, uh, would be European made, yeah. but it would also be a trade item. Yeah, it's an IDAG. An IDAG? Yeah. That's, the, that's the name given to it by the Hudson's Bay Company. All right. So yeah. all of these things 
the Hudson's Bay Company would sure. bring to the native people, sure. and the native people would bring them their beaver pelts. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and it's interesting, when you look at the society of the day, the Indians were so well versed with the country, they knew it extremely well, like the back of their hands. They were good on the rivers, and this shot shows you yeah. two of the Indians pulling up the Skeena River, which is relatively close yeah. to the uh, And that would be Forts a dugout canoe. Yeah, a dugout canoe. That and one of the Indians is dressed in a, in a you know, uniform. He likes the idea of a uniform. They like the color, they like the feel of it, and it gave them a certain amount of prestige in the, in the band. So, um, and you know, he had a lot of things. You had the potlatch, which was all through the southern interior on the coast and so on. And the potlatch really was, it was a good thing. It was a socially a good thing because it was, it distributed the wealth from the very, very powerful, usually a chief, down to those who were less wealthy, in some cases poor and he would be pauperized in the, in the process. So he would spend some years gathering it up again and have another potlatch. And then uh, to, to, to administer to the Indians who were sick, they had the shamans. And the shamans, generally speaking, when you look at the notes, were very, very effective. And, and then they accepted a gift. If somebody was very ill, they would accept a gift from the family. If that person did not survive, they returned the gift. If he survived, they kept the gift. If he survived, gift. they kept the gift. And what, they, sure. did they use sort of natural herbal medicines? And, uh, yeah, they I mean, did. It wasn't just incantations, no, there it was, was medicine as well. There were some incantations, uh, some of it was mystical, but they used a lot of natural herbs in the area. Okay. And, and this area was, was really quite intriguing because in the 1870s, the Amanika rush came into its own, and by, 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 by the 1890s and the turn of the century, it had slipped a little bit. Now we take a look at Manson Town, which was the biggest of the old mining camps, and this is what's left in about 1913. This is, this is Manson Town? Yeah. And that's, or Manson Creek, you can yeah. call it either way. Sometimes they call it Manson Town, now it's Manson Creek. All of that gravel around the edges, that's an uh, example of... Uh, tailings. Tailings from, yeah. uh, from, from the, the placer, placer operation. Yeah. They got tens of thousands of ounces, probably, on the total, probably several hundred thousand ounces out of the Amanika. And the records will never tell you exactly how much they got. Kind of neat. Look, at they've got uh, sure. uh, pathways all across the sure gravel burden there to get from uh, yeah. cabin to cabin and get yeah, where they're they going. And uh, this shot again showing that, well, Manson Creek uh, was a reasonably substantial place. Uh, yeah, flag poles and log cabins. Sure. Do you know when that photo was taken? Because it 1913. Looks, is that right? Yeah. And that was left at that time. Yeah. And look at in this one here, we've got uh, horses on an abandoned That's right. street. That's right. They're grazing on the abandoned street of uh, Manson Creek. And who would have owned those horses? Are they well, still I, think a packer, I think a packer owned those horses for sure. Yeah. He just turned them loose. And, 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 and there's probably, because this was taken by a mining survey crew, mm -hmm. these pictures. And that's what, they're, that's what they're essentially doing is taking pictures of their own horses, I think. Now, I always, when you get a European involvement with native cultures, the native cultures end up taking, uh, doing very badly by it. I mean, disease and alcohol and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's true. In, in many instances, that's true. But the carrier Indians were pretty resolute uh, individuals. They were known as independent, extremely independent. Chief Kwa, for instance, lived to be 110 years old. He was very virile. He was uh, extremely intelligent and high-ranking individual. The Hudson's Bay Company listened to him very, very carefully. You had families like uh, the Prince family, which uh, one of the one of the young young women on the Prince family was was addressed by the whites and Indians alike as the princess. And she was absolutely ravishing looking young woman. And uh, she was of a noble lineage in that particular part of the country. And so you have Fort St. James as, as the focal point for, the, for both the Indians and whites. And the Indians outnumbered the whites about 100 to 7. That's about the average at that time. And uh, so obviously uh, the uh, two societies mixed regularly and often. Sure. Uh, taking a look at some of these, everybody loves a good party. Sure. And so you've got, uh, for example, uh, shooting parties yeah. going on. Sure you have. Now, these guys would be pretty competent, I would think. We're all outdoorsmen marksmen, or yeah. is that just a legend? Well, really? you know, the, the Indians in the area, were were very good at trapping and they were they were they were they, they took to a gun just like a like a duck took to water and look at what would these guys be competing for look at them all there they would That's be competing on dominion the day time, i yeah? think mike this would be dominion day big shooting match between the whites and the indians and usually it traded hands uh, there's some very good white hunters some excellent indian shots yeah. and uh the sharpshooters on both sides were very keen on winning the competition especially in a place like fort st james yeah. and about a third of that crowd are, are indians in that particular shot that's taken around 1912 look at there's there. fedoras there's uh, sure. they, the kind of the rcmp oh, style yeah. stetson oh, yeah. Yeah. you can see guys there it looked yeah. like they have lee enfield yeah. some people with the but surprisingly kind of even some of the old Old Indians who used muskets 
were right in the competition. Now that's interesting. Yeah. Look at the and here's a race, the sack race, yeah. popular activity, probably yeah. a May Day event. Yeah, but the interesting thing about the sack race is if you look closely at that picture, Mike, and I find it rather interesting, uh, is that the, there are three or four men in that race and they're not even coming close. Women always win the sack race. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And look at here's the of course the uh, rooting gallery, yeah, the audience right. is all there. Watching the, the festivities, what? and that's right at the gates of Fort St. James. Now some nothing looks quite as strange, I guess, as uh, ladies all dolled up in their fine with their bonnets and in a race. Dominion Day 1913, I think. And yeah. uh, definitely <laughs> Fort St. James. It came with the Fort St. James collection. Look at the wonderful face oh, of the sure, lady sure. who's trailing. But she's trying, <laughs> she's trying very yeah, she hard. Is. And uh, wh what would prompt this guy to shinny up this particular flag? Well, pole, he's is showing it? that he can do it and nobody else can do it. And that's down by the wharf, you know, down where, yeah. they, where they transported the, the bales of furs on, on the boats to make its way down eventually to Victoria and be transported overseas. Look at the, who do we owe, to whom, I guess, do we owe the credit for these wonderful photographs that take us right to that country. Uh, I don't have that in the archives. Usually you, you know the name of the photographer. I do not have the name of that particular photographer. I always, always like to toss out that uh, invitation because very often yeah. our viewers uh, know the kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Listen, we've got to wrap, get moving here. There are some characters that we want to, at least one larger than life character we want to talk about. We've touched on them before, but we'll touch on them again. Okay, we'll do that right after this break. Bill's holding us in suspense. Don't go away. We continue to tell the story of Fort St. James in just a moment. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley. Fort St. James is our locale, but some people, some people, and a larger-than-life character. Yeah. Who is he? Jean Coe, better known as Catiline. And everybody in British Columbia, I think everybody, certainly in the North, knew Catiline. Now this guy had an awesome uh, extended uh, history in this oh, area. Yeah, he had a reputation as good as the man. He was, he came from Catalonia, so he, hence he adopted the name Catiline. He came up from the U.S. He packed in that country for about half a century, started as a young man in 1858, was still like packing. A, he looks sort of like, you know, a uh, Wild Bill he style of flamboyant character. flamboyant guy. Uh, every time he saw a woman, he would bow, very courtly bow, a very courtly, interesting man. He dressed in, in finery even in his later life. He was... Uh, he was broad-shouldered. He had very long arms and big hands, which is rather interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally an individual you never forgot. One of those individuals who was, had an electric sort of personality. Character. Yeah. Now you say that people then uh, have called him illiterate, but yeah. you have a signature of his. I have a letter that is a full letter describing Catiline and what he's doing, and he has signed the bottom, Jean Cole which is rather interesting. Okay. And uh, he packed all through that country, wouldn't hire whites or Indians for his pack train. The Indians didn't like that continuous work, and the whites, they wanted to do something else, so he hired Chinese. But his secundo, his... his second in command? Second in command was a guy called Dave Wiggins, and we have a picture of him yeah. in actually one of these photographs. Certainly it is Dave Wiggins, and, and he's standing there, and he's the guy who commanded the pack train, essentially. And he was the right-hand man, of course, of, of Catiline. And another thing he did, he made sure they packed on one of these mules, one of these Chetty mules, they packed a little chair carved by Dave Wiggins, well, a fairly big chair, actually, out of solid birch. And any time they stopped to negotiate, to have a meeting, he would take the chair off, put it in the center of the meeting, and there Catiline would sit in all his splendor. He actually officiated from a of chair course, of office of course. wherever he happened to go. And Catiline was extremely respected by virtually everyone. He uh, had a great fondness for Judge Bigby, and an interesting story comes out of Yale, uh, about 1858 or 1859, when Bigby was laying down the law and the Canadian sort of uh, way to do it, and that was correct. And uh, there was a miners' meeting about it, and a lot of the American miners didn't like Bigby and didn't like what he was doing, and they said, what do you think, Catiline? Catiline looked around the crew and reached into his boot and pulled out a long Mexican knife, a throwing knife, sharpened it, and he says, he stands up and addresses the crowd. He says, I stand by the judge. And he always added an A to a lot of words. And that was the end of the conversation. It really was. <laughs> Another case actually might happen. Like happened in, um, when he was an older man in Hazelton, 
and he was probably in his 70s then, and he went into a hotel in Hazleton to imbibe a little bit. Mm -hmm. When he when he drank, he drank cognac, cognac usually. Yep. And uh, when he had cognac, he would drink some, and he'd put some in his hand and play a little on the outside and a little on the inside. And on the outside, of course, meant his hair. And of course, he had a mane of hair at 75 years old, even just before he died, still had, and it didn't have hard. I've got to try hair that, cognac. Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay, uh, fine, I'll do that. And, uh, <laughs> and another, another instance where, anyway, he was in this hotel, and a bunch of young roughs in there, probably young miners on the, on the prod, were making fun of Catiline. And he listened to it for a while. Very interesting man, never easily aroused. His anger was not easily aroused. Finally, he got up, walked across the room, and put a little X in the wall with his fingernail. And everyone was watching him, wondering what he was doing. Then he walks back to, right across the room, turns around, whirls, and goes with his knife. Knife hit dead center of the X he put there with his fingers. <laughs> and <laughs> silence prevailed over the whole room. And he said, sacred dam, that's all, that's all. And that was, and that was all. That there was, was nothing the end more. of this yeah, game. nothing more So this guy, and here is a picture of him as an old man. And as you say, yeah. for nearly half a century, yeah. he does the work in this forbidding country. Yeah, well, in another case, he got in a water dispute with a bunch of ranchers. And he yeah. had had this before. And unfortunately, they wanted the water. And, uh, and Ju Judge Begbie said, okay, divide the water. And judge, the judge asked him after, they said, well, what would you like, uh, uh, what would you have done if, if you'd lost? And he said, then I'd kill it a judge. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> Fortunately, he'd already sided yeah. with Begbie on a couple of occasions. But, but interesting story. I have a gold $20 piece. And Catiline had a liaison with a young Indian woman. And, all, and he provided her with gold coins. And I'm not going to tell you where, but somewhere in a root cellar in one of the Indian reservations in British Columbia is probably the remaining part of that hoard of gold coins. Because every time the family needed money, they would retreat to the root cellar, this is the Indian family, and they would bring back a handful of gold coins. And the root cellar is still there, the reserve is still there, uh, and the location is not exactly precise, although the reserve is precise. So Catiline would have given these gold yeah. coins to and his paramour? And yes, and certainly. There, they had spent hundreds and hundreds of these gold coins. I think some may still be in that now caved-in root cellar. There's always, there's always another little yeah. hitch in there, isn't it? This guy, Catiline, he's the stuff that uh, Western legends are sure, made of. Sure. I mean, we've heard of Jesse James and Wild Bill yeah. Hickok, but Catiline's unstated yeah. till now. Yeah, yeah, he is, although he's well known in the north. He's buried in, uh, very close to New Hazelton. Great story. Yeah. Fort St. James, Carrier Nation Enclave. I love the concept of the white canoes coming ashore and the gunfire and the difference. Uh, just like an <laughs> aliens from outer space and the uh, transition uh, from uh, Carrier Nation to Hudson's Bay Company Fort to uh, Manson Creek and all of that. Sure. Bill, thank you very much. You're welcome, Mike. Where do we go next time on Gold Trails and Ghost Town? I haven't the faintest idea, but join us. We'll tell you more stories of the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia as Gold Trails and Ghost Towns returns. Bye-bye.